Thank you for listening to the Bladder Battle Podcast special series, I See in the Dark. This series dives deep into the perplexing disease, interstitial cystitis. This podcast is intended to bring awareness and create conversation around the illness by providing possible remedies, tips for managing the disease, how you can show support, and so much more. This podcast is not intended to be a medical alternative for physician care, nor to treat, cure, or prevent any illness or disease. Always consult with a physician for professional medical advice. Today, we are discussing another one of my absolute favorite topics, nutrition, as well as trigger foods and the IC diet for those with interstitial cystitis. So joining me today is registered dietitian, Sarah Williams. She has over seven years of experience and just recently launched her own virtual practice. So Sarah, welcome to the show and thank you so much for being on here to talk all about nutrition. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, absolutely. I'm very excited to dive in and hopefully get some answers that we are all seeking right now. So first, I kind of want to start it off with your background and your personal story with IC. So I have been a dietitian for about eight years now, and I kind of grew up always having frequent UTIs. So I felt like my body was prone to UTIs. Um, In 2012, I went to the doctor for what I thought was another UTI, but I actually ended up at that point getting diagnosed with interstitial cystitis. And prior to my diagnosis, I had never even heard of that condition. And luckily, I've been able to control most of my symptoms with diet changes. Wow, that's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, very lucky when it comes to that. Absolutely. Your story sounds very similar to a lot of people that I've had on the show, what they thought were chronic UTIs. So it's kind of the typical story. How long did you kind of battle through having those UTIs? Um, Several years. Wow. I was really jealous of people who had never had a UTI. (laughs) (laughs) I know, right? You're like, how have you never had one of these? Yeah, I didn't understand (laughs) how that was possible. And I had such a different experience. So even when I was really little, I had several UTIs, like growing up, like school age. Yeah, that sounds uh, very similar to my situation and exact same feeling. I used to wonder how my friends have never had one. I'm like, what are you talking about here? Like, this is such a uh, common feeling for me. Yes, I can definitely relate there. So was it kind of getting the diagnosis and realizing that you could do some diet changes that inspired you to become a dietitian? Or were you already a dietitian when you started going through this? So I already was a dietitian when I started going through this. Actually, that kind of happened at the same time. So I became a dietitian in 2012, the same year that I got diagnosed with interstitial cystitis. And honestly, I was kind of shocked when the doctor told me, oh, just look it up. There's a whole diet for it. Because I (laughs) honestly didn't learn about the IC diet during school, probably because when you're in school to become a dietitian, it's very focused on research. You know, what does the research say for different diets and different health conditions? And there's honestly not a lot of research for diet for interstitial cystitis. That's really interesting to hear, honestly. I mean, there's not a lot of research for IC in general, but to have someone that's gone through an actual program and you're saying that there wasn't a lot around this, you never even heard of it. So that's kind of scary to think about. (laughs) Yes, for sure. When you started to become a dietitian, did you really uh, start to focus your practice around interstitial cystitis or did you kind of go into different areas of nutrition? So I, when I first became a dietitian, my first job was in the hospital setting and I was kind of doing everything um, from adult weight loss to diabetes, heart healthy diet educations, tube feedings, IV nutrition. Um, And I always knew that I wanted to work in healthcare. Growing up, I always liked math and science a lot. But I also have kind of a weak stomach. And I did not want to be around a lot of blood or other bodily fluids. So um I actually did a lot of job shadowing before I became a dietitian to explore different career options. 
And after I shadowed a dietitian and realized that, wow, I can actually make a career out of nutrition, I knew I found the right thing for me. I've, I've basically always been interested in nutrition, fitness, and health growing up. So dietitians have so many different career opportunities and paths to go down. I spent several years working in the hospital setting, eventually moved from the adult population to pediatrics and babies, so kids and babies, and recently started my virtual private practice. And I was thinking a lot about what can I focus on? Like, what do I want my niche to be for private practice? And I realized like, oh my gosh, no one's really even, no dietitians are even talking about diet for interstitial cystitis. And it kind of like clicked, like, this is what I need to do because I have the condition myself. I understand what people are going through. Plus I have this nutrition background knowledge and skills. So I thought I need to combine those and focus on IC. Yeah, that's incredible because uh, even for me, uh, after I got diagnosed, you know, I was given the IC diet sheet. Um, I do have a little bit of a nutrition background. So I was already sort of ahead of the curve for the average person. But when I went to actually seek out a nutritionist, because I thought that would be a great next step, I couldn't really find anyone that was specializing in this. So I think you found <laughs> you found your your niche there and you had the experience. So it, it can definitely make someone who has IC feel so much more comfortable. And the same goes for a urologist. You're not really going to feel comfortable unless they've actually gone through the condition themselves. So I think you're definitely going in the right direction there. And it's very exciting that you're that you recently launched a virtual practice. I mean, the time is now, of course, you know, with this pandemic, everything going virtual. But uh, specifically for people with IC, you know, sometimes it's hard to get out of the house. Um, you don't always want to go and drive to a doctor's appointment. I mean, we, we go to the doctor so frequently. So I think it's really great that you just launched that. So um, tell me a little bit more about how uh, a nutrition session would actually go for somebody. First, I usually find out where a client or patient is now. Um, I'll get a nutrition history, find out, you know, what things have they already tried? What have they already figured out that works for them? And then where is there room for maybe some changes or a way to make things a little bit better for them? Um, once I do that, I will, you know, try and create a plan that's going to help them basically get optimum nutrition while minimizing IC symptoms. And everybody's different. So it's always good to keep, you know, an open mind. And there's going to be some trial and error involved. And what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for the other, which, which can be really frustrating for people. Well, I think that is one of the most frustrating uh, aspects of IC is, you know, we're handed that sheet, that IC diet sheet. We're told to just cut all of those items out. Um, there's really no guidance on, well, you know, why don't you try eliminating a few of these um, and then reintroducing them to see if that really is a trigger for you? Um, because like for myself, um, you know, I'm very standard. Spicy food, tomatoes, citrus are like my big problems, which I think, you know, everyone can kind of relate to that to an aspect. But someone else with IC might be able to handle some citrus fruits. So it's just very um, perplexing and confusing. Let's kind of talk about the IC diet, because I think it's a very lamented thing that I see people posting about this on support groups. You know, they're like, I got this sheet. I don't even know what to do. This is... Um, you know, very depressing now that I have to cut out, you know, coffee and chocolate and all these great foods. Yes. So the IC diet is basically a list, a long list of foods from the Interstitial Societies Association and Interstitial Societies Network. And it basically breaks down foods into three categories. So there's bladder friendly, try it, and caution. Um, try it means that these items might be okay for you and caution means that those items will likely cause symptoms for you. So we already said everyone is different and 
There are some common trigger or problem items, like you mentioned some of them. Um, and there's some re- there's a few research studies out there. And one study showed that like 80% of patients with IC that, they, that were involved in the study had issues with this list of foods. So coffee, most teas, most soda, especially diet soda. Most alcoholic beverages, citrus fruits and juices, cranberry juice, tomato products, soy products, artificial sweeteners, hot peppers, and spicy foods. And there's definitely some things on that list that are, you know, a big deal, especially coffee, right? There's tons of coffee drinkers. So um, it can be really kind of devastating to get handed that list when you're newly diagnosed. What I would say is start by trying a little time period without those items that I just listed and see if that's enough for you. Some people that's going to be, if they eliminate that little list, which does have some, you know, big items on it, but if you eliminate that little list, that might be enough for you. So when you're first starting out, you're like so overwhelmed. What can I eat? What can I, you know, what do I need to avoid? I would focus on avoiding those most common triggers first for a couple of weeks and see if that is enough for you before we go, you know, doing a complete 180 and thinking we have to change every single thing that we're doing. Yeah, because that can be extremely overwhelming to just cut everything out and then think that you can never have it again. So I think that's a really good strategy and really good tip. Um, Can you touch on theories behind some of these foods um, and diets that might trigger a flare? More research is definitely needed on this topic, but there are several theories out there about how foods or diet components might cause an IC flare. So one theory is that a layer of the bladder wall is damaged and this damaged area might allow substances from urine that are present in the urine after eating and drinking to seep into the bladder tissue and cause pain and discomfort. Um, Another theory is that certain food or drink ingredients might activate sensitive nerve endings in the bladder and cause symptoms. A different theory is that people with IC might have higher levels of pain receptors that react to certain food components. And kind of the last theory is that some researchers think that IC bladder pain might actually be like a referred pain from the large intestine that crosses over to the bladder. So you can see that's a wide range of theories, and there's really not a clear answer at this time. Yeah, there's not really a clear answer. There are lots of theories, uh, but those are interesting, uh, especially the last one, that we have higher pain receptors. I mean, that makes sense to me (laughs) because we're we're always in pain, but it'd be interesting once there's more research uh, conducted around these theories to kind of see what they actually pinpoint. Yeah. What other uh, diets or recommendations would you find if you did like a Google search? So I've seen things around like low oxalate and the AIP diet. What are some of your thoughts on some of those other diets to potentially follow? Um, Yeah, if you Google diet for interstitial cystitis, there's so much stuff that comes up. And a lot of it is conflicting information. A lot of it is not research based. So that can be very confusing and frustrating. There's the low oxalate diet, like you mentioned, the AIP diet. There's gluten-free, dairy-free, plant-based. I mean, basically every possible diet that you can come up with, it seems like people are trying to link to IC. And that's probably just because there's not a lot of research. There's not a lot of answers. So it's like, why not try another type of diet? From my training to become a dietitian, I have it ingrained in me that research-based, evidence-based, nutrition recommendations are what 
are the best for clients and patients. I don't think there's um, any harm in trying like a diet that you find online for interstitial cystitis. And if you know that like following a gluten-free diet is what you need to do for your IC, I think that's totally fine. You know, listen to your body. If you, you know your body best and what works for you, but really the best plan is going to be an elimination diet using the food list from the interstitial cystitis network and following those bladder friendly foods for several weeks while keeping a food diary. And you can, you can do it on your phone or you can do it on a piece of paper or whatever people prefer different things. So you would list out what you're eating and then next to it, note your symptoms. And some people need to follow this type of diet where they do only the bladder friendly foods for two, three, four weeks, maybe even longer, you would want to follow that elimination diet until you see some kind of improvement in your symptoms. And it may, they may not be gone completely, but if it's like less pain or less frequency, less discomfort, then, then we're at a point where we would want to start challenging the body with some different foods. Um, when you're reintroducing a food after you've done this elimination diet, you really only want to add one new item every three to four days. And when you add a new item in, you want to do just a really tiny amount the first day. Like, let's say it's a banana, you're going to do like, just two inches of a banana the first day, then the next day, maybe you, if you're fine, you're going to do half a banana. If you're still fine on the next day, maybe do a whole banana. Because we're not only trying to figure out which foods bother you, but right. what's the dose or amount of the food that bothers you. So that way, you know, like if you have something with a little bit of banana in it, it's not going to be a big deal. But if you eat a whole banana every day, then that is going to bother you. So it's kind of like we're trying to learn two different things with that. Also, you want to start you want to start small because what if it does bother you, right? You don't want to be we want to minimize like the painful reaction. That's why you would start slow. Basically, you would continue that process until you've gone through all the questionable foods. And if you have, you know, if you've done your three days with a new item and you have no reaction, you could put it on your own personal bladder friendly list. If you have a reaction, you're going to put it on your list of foods to avoid. And then you're going to eventually develop your own personal food list for IC, basically, because everyone is so different. Right. That makes a lot of sense. It also helps your family and friends kind of understand. So, you know, if you need to whip it out at dinner, you go out to dinner, it just kind of makes it easier for people to understand. It, that's what I found. Uh, just making a detailed list about it and saying, these are the foods I can't have. So if you're going to make me dinner, this is what you need to avoid. If we're going to go out to eat, please bear with me because <laughs> I got a long list of foods. I got to say, know this, know that. So yeah, that, that's, that's a great tip. Now I kind of want to get into just briefly the AIP diet because uh, IC isn't considered an autoimmune disease, but it acts like one. So what are your thoughts on potentially following the AIP diet? The AIP diet is there's not a lot of research. I kind of feel like people are wanting to do the AIP diet for all kinds of conditions. And I think it really mm -hmm. depends on what works for you. I don't think there's anything wrong with trying it. But it is sort of similar to an elimination diet. Right. So I think it would be you know, kind of the similar process to what we talked about. Yeah, there's a lot of foods on that yes. <laughs> diet to avoid. Uh, when I first looked into it, it was extremely overwhelming to me because I'm also plant based. So, right. you know, to cut out like legumes and beans and nuts and things like that, it seemed to be um, just unattainable for me yeah. because I definitely need to get protein right. and some of those vital nutrients. So I think it's important to note, you know, not every diet out there is right for, for everybody to follow. So, right. yeah, I mean, of course, I think if your doctor maybe recommends it, you know, follow up with the nutrition to really see if it is right for you. Right. Because it, might, it just might not be. Um, one last thing that I kind of want to get into. So, you know, food is medicine. We should eat a balance 
balanced diet and, you know, really get all of our nutrients in there. What are your thoughts on supplementation? Because there's so many great supplements on the market for IC from aloe supplements to pumpkin seed oil to D manos. So what are your thoughts on kind of utilizing those to uh, sort of also help kind of relieve the pain and some of those symptoms? Um, as far as supplements go, I would, you know, if your physician recommends it, I think that's fine. If you want to try a supplement that you've seen on a support group or read about online, I think that's fine. I would just be cautious because supplements are not really regulated. So, you know, unlike our food system, our supplement system is not closely regulated. So, the big thing is like whatever supplements we're buying, are we really getting what they say is on the label? Right. Because honestly, there's not really anyone checking that. There's not like a clear like, yes, this is the supplement you need to use for IC. It's basically more research is needed. When you are trying different supplements, I would look for USP on the label. That means that an independent third party has, you know, basically said that this supplement is safe and good. So that's my tip for supplements. Look for the USP um, little stamp on there. Hmm. That's great. I've actually never heard of that. So sometimes you don't know uh, where they're coming from. You know, they can have that, you know, GMP certification. They can say made in the USA, even though they're actually manufactured in China, but they're, you know, bottled in the US. So there's a lot of um, controversy and misleading information around supplements. So that's definitely a really great tip. Before we wrap this up, I kind of want to go back to the food diary tip that you shared. How detailed should one be when they're when they're making a food diary? And if you have any other closing like recommendations or tips for somebody uh, newly diagnosed? When you're doing this food diary, you really want to be as specific as you can. So I would say you're going to write down everything you eat and drink throughout the day and like the serving size of each item like was it half a cup or one cup and then you're going to make another note next to that what were your symptoms like that day you know like and whatever your main symptoms are if it's pain if it's frequency if it's all of the above just being as detailed as you can is going to help you later on when you're trying to figure out okay was it you know this item that caused that reaction or was it this other one and the other thing is the more detailed your records are, that is helpful also to any like medical professionals that are helping you, whether it's a dietitian or your doctor. And it's definitely can be overwhelming. So just, you know, keep in mind that it takes some time to figure out what works for you. And everyone is just so different. Um, I just want to also mention that support groups, like a Facebook page or something, it can be very helpful. But I see a lot of posts on there about, you know, what's, what's the best salad dressing I can use. And it's like, well, it's great to get ideas, but also what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another. So it may not be like as helpful to ask those kinds of questions on the support group page as people would hope that it, that it would be, um, not to be negative. I just wanted to point that out that, mm -hmm you know, this is so individualized that just be careful when people are telling you what to do for your diet for IC, because it may be totally different experience for them and you. Another example is someone says that they do gluten-free and dairy-free for their IC. And then someone new to IC is so like worried that now they have to eat gluten-free and dairy-free. It's like, well, maybe not. You might be, you might be actually totally fine. Maybe these cheese sticks are actually going to soothe your bladder right. and they bother someone else. So it can be helpful to have that support place, but also I think can be harmful at times if we don't, if we're not aware that we don't need to take everything to heart that we see on there, basically. No, that's. Definitely great advice because there's a lot of just inquiries like that that I've seen. And it, you know, it's hard because, uh, you know, someone can suggest a recipe for a salad dressing with, you know, pumpkin seed oil and apple cider vinegar, but that vinegar might just destroy somebody else. Exactly. So, yes. And, you know, don't be afraid to ask your doctor or a registered dietitian, you know, for help. Because even if you aren't new to IC, like a lot of times with this 
condition, we're chronically avoiding certain food groups, like sometimes entire food groups, like citrus fruits. And if that's happening, it might be helpful for a dietitian to like evaluate your diet and see, you know, are we missing out on any key nutrients? Like, are we getting enough other sources of vitamin C? So that's just, you know, if you're avoiding whole food groups, it might be good to check in with a dietitian. Definitely. If our audience wants to know more or if they would like to reach out to you, uh, can they do so on Facebook, Instagram? Do you have a website? Yes, um, I do a lot on Instagram. So my Instagram handle is at interstitial societies dot dietitian. And I have a link in my Instagram bio for anyone who wants to sign up for any kind of um, I do online nutrition counseling like with video chat. Perfect. Well, that is wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show today and you know, sharing your information about nutrition for IC. So thank you so much for stopping in on the show today. Thanks so much. And I also want to thank my audience for taking the time to listen to the bladder battle podcast special series i see in the dark make sure to subscribe if you're listening on youtube or leave a rating or review on spotify google or apple podcasts and stay tuned for the next episode right here on the bladder battle podcast <laughs>